Hi everyone, um, just give us a few seconds to let a few more people join us before we start. How's everyone doing today? Leave me a comment to say hi so I know who's tuning in. So um, today I'm going to be talking about the topic of blaming. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them, but I will answer them towards the end. And um, if you have any requests for prayers and offerings to be made, also you can leave me a message in the comment section and um, we will get the prayers and offerings done for you at the end. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm going to be talking about blaming today and um, just waiting for a few more people to join us before we start. Uh, good morning, Bradley. It's nice to see you. What time is it in Canada right now? Uh, also, let me know if there are any problems with the sound and with um, any technical things, um, and I'll try to get them fixed on online, on live for you. So I'm obviously filming in the gift building. Um, there will be people moving in and out because it is our office workspace. So you might hear beeps and buzzing and things like that. And uh, I thought maybe, you know, make it a little bit more organic, perhaps. Hi, Iman. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining in. I hope that you had a good session with uh, JP during the Mindful Morning Meditation, which is held um, every Saturday and Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Malaysian time. Um, <laughs> hi, David. <laughs> nice to see you here. All right, so um, it's 10.02 a.m., so um, let's get started. Um, ah! 7 p.m., so you're on night shift. That's interesting. Um, I don't know if you want, if it's appropriate, maybe share a little bit about how the COVID-19 situation is going in British Columbia. Is that where you are, Bradley? Um, share in the comment section. Um, hi, Yo Miao Ki. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, before every Dharma teaching, Rinpoche had advised us, or Dharma sharing, Rinpoche had advised us to um, set a motivation so let's do that, um, especially motivation for the speakers for the knowledge that they're about to share. And this tradition came from, uh, from Ananda. So after Buddha Shakyamuni passed away, when Ananda first recounted and recalled all of the teachings that Buddha Shakyamuni had given during the first Buddhist council, uh, Ananda started every single teaching with, thus have I heard. So um, that was uh, to ascribe the source of the teachings that he had received to his guru, Buddha Shakyamuni. So in our case, um, I go for refuge in my lama, from whom I have received these teachings, and I go for refuge in the lineage lamas from whom my lama has received these teachings. All right, so let's get started. Uh, for those of you who know me, don't know me, I don't know. Uh, my name is Pastor Jinai. I am a pastor here in Kachara Forest Retreat uh, as part of the Kachara organization which is based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And as I'm saying that, I have just realized that if you're on the Kachara Facebook fan page, you will probably already know that. So that was not very bright of me. But anyway, um, I was online as usual the other day and I came across a famous phrase which is you know often shared around on the internet and um, I'm sure many of you have heard this phrase before um, which is great minds discuss ideas, uh, average minds discuss events and small minds discuss people and um, as I was thinking about that phrase, um, contemplating the phrase, I realized um, I what I wanted to talk about today was actually the topic of blaming and uh, when does blaming start, why it starts, why we blame, um, why it's illogical to blame, how can we stop blaming and what happens when we stop blaming. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this action, this quality of ours blaming is because number one, everybody does it, no one is free from blame, um, but we can implement many things, many ways of um, reducing how much we blame 
And um, there are many, many benefits in reducing how much we blame. Whether we're Buddhist or not, um, reducing blame does have its benefits. All right, so... Um, oh, hi, King Hoi. Nice to see you here. All right, so the habit of blaming starts from very, very young. If you think about it, it starts from when we are children. You know, when if we have siblings, um, even in school, for example, you know, the first thing that kids will always do once they get into trouble is they will blame. They will always blame the other party for whatever mischief or whatever trouble that they've gotten into. Uh, I remember when I was young, I had um, quite a love-hate relationship with my siblings. So we would get into a lot of fights because we were, we were extremely close in age. Um, there's like a one to one and a half year difference between all of us. So, you know, being so close in age, um, obviously there were a lot of conflicts, a lot of arguments, a lack of sharing um, between the three of us. So we fought a lot. And um, the first thing we would always do when we, were, when we would get caught is, our you know, we would go, but she started it, you know, or um, it's her fault. You know, that's the first thing that we would do. Because at the same time, it was also our parents who asked us who started it, right? So with that question, who started it, it's already training us to blame someone else. It's already th telling us to think, okay, who's responsible for this? And it's never I'm responsible for it. It's always the other party's responsible for it. So um, there was one particular fight um, which was quite bad between my sister and I and um, you know when my dad caught us he pulled us by the ear like this and then made us sit down and the two of us were sobbing and heaving and then um, my dad of course asked who started it so my sister and I immediately bah, 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 you know she started it no she started it it's her fault it's her fault and then my dad let us say our piece and then when we had stopped talking or rather stopped bickering my dad asked us to say five nice things about each other. So in between tears, um, we refused initially. And then my dad said, no, I want you to say five nice things about your sister. So I started and I was sobbing and I was heaving and I was like, she's kind, she's very generous, you know, and, and so on. And then by the time I had finished my five and by the time my sister had finished her five, um, the high emotions between us in that childhood conflict had already calmed down because my dad had trained us to recognize that beyond the arguments and beyond the fighting, um, there were good qualities about another person. But the reason why I bring up this story is because um, the habit to blame starts from when we are very, very young. Um, and the thing is, everything around us conditions us to blame. Um, we have politicians who condition, condition us to blame. You know, um, they're very, very famous for giving what are called non-apologies. So they will say sorry without saying sorry. Um, you have coaches for sports teams blaming, oh, you know, it was the weather, it was our lack of training, it was our lack of funding. It's always something else, right? And you also have the less successful entrepreneurs blaming. So... Um, in bringing this up, what I also want to say is that... Um, oh, hi Jacinta, thank you for joining us. So in bringing this up, what I also want to say is that um, it's very important for parents not to blame one another or not to engage in blaming in front of their children because you'd be surprised at what kids pick up from a very, very young age. I was just sharing on a f Facebook group recently. Um, it wasn't related to blaming, but it was related to the things that um, had imprinted on me from a very, very young age. Um, you know, when I was three or four, I was taken to a gymnastics tryout class. I know, I would never do gymnastics now, look at me now, right? But at three or four years old, you know, I was taken to a gymnastics class because it was like all the rage for kids to do that. And um, right in front of me, the coach told my mother, um, this girl's not suited for gymnastics. She's not built for it. Okay, and I was, bear in mind, I was three or four years old. So you would think, you know, at that kind of age, um, children at that age wouldn't really be aware of what's going on around the world, but they are. Um, they may not be, have the language ability to express um, their awareness of the world around them, but it does leave an imprint. So it's very important for children um, not to observe <clears throat> their parents blaming anyone or even blaming one another. All right, so why do we blame? Just a few more people joining us. Hi, uh, Kok Lian. Nice to see you here. I noticed it's all the Mindful Morning Meditation crowd. So I guess you guys must have uh, finished with JV's Mindful Morning Meditation session. I hope you guys had a good session. He's a really, really skilled, capable leader. And I've really enjoyed helping him to um, facilitate the uh, sessions over the last, I got like 40 days or something. Uh, anyway, so why do we blame? 
Uh, we blame because something has gone wrong, something hasn't gone to plan, and uh, something didn't go according to our expectations, right? So it happens all the time. It happens every single day um, from the smallest things to the biggest things. Um, a husband might blame the wife when he comes home if there's no food on the table. Yes, I'm talking about very, very specific, gender specific roles here. But you know, husband might blame the wife. Um, colleagues might blame one another at work. A boss might blame subordinates at work. You know, there's blame being ascribed all the time. Even now, there's blame being ascribed during this COVID-19 pandemic. This person didn't react fast enough. This politician's um, too focused on politicking and not enough on fighting the pandemic and, and so on. So, you know, blaming happens around us all the time. And when we're young, you know, it might be cute when you see a small child, you know, having the presence of mind to blame someone else. It might be cute. But when you get older, blaming isn't the cutest thing. Um, it actually ends up getting pretty tiring hanging around people who blame all the time. So why is it that people blame? What is the underlying quality for people who blame? Um, two main factors. The first one is insecurity. And the second one is selfishness. And why is that? Because when you blame, essentially what you're saying is, I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be harmed. I don't want my situation around me to change. And if things change, how am I going to be able to handle it? So that's our insecurity and that is our selfishness talking. We're not looking at the situation at hand that needs to be dealt with. We're looking at me, myself and I. How can I protect myself when things around me change? So based on that, then what happens is when we blame, we end up self-preserving and we end up engaging in self-protection. Oh, hi, Rina. Nice to see you here. And uh, hi, Suzanne. Nice to see you here too. Um, if you guys are just joining us, anyone else just joining us, I'm talking about the topic of blaming today. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them down on the comment section of this video and then I'll get to them towards the end, all right? And if I don't, I will actually come back onto the feed and answer them for you after the live feed has ended. So um, going back to what I was talking about, I actually have my notes here um, to help me remember so that I stay on track and I don't wander off as I have a tendency to do. But um, why is it that we blame insecurity and selfishness, um, a lack of belief in ourselves, in our ability to handle change. So then that ends up in self-preservation and it ends up in self-protection. Uh, we blame because we don't want to be demoted. We don't want people to change how they look at us. Um, and we don't want our position in life to be changed somehow. Even from a young age, um, what you have is children who um, like, you know, if they're promised, oh, if you're a good girl, you're a good boy, then you'll get an ice cream at the end of the day, and then they get into a fight. They're never going to say, oh, it's, it's me that started the fight. They're going to blame the other person. Why? Because they still want the ice cream. They still want that advantage that they perceive that they get from um, if they engaged in blaming. So why do we blame? It's because we want to maintain things according to the status quo. Iman, I do see your question, and I'll get to that towards the end, all right? Um, so blaming is based on a wish for things to be permanent and for things to be unchanging. And the thing about blaming is that it's completely illogical, all right? And it's completely illogical to engage in blaming because um, we want things to be permanent. We want to maintain the status quo because as we know, um, the nature of samsara is that things are impermanent. Um, so blaming because we want things to maintain as a status quo is illogical. It contradicts the nature of samsara. Um, we know that samsara is impermanent. We know that samsara is always changing. And what about samsara doesn't change? Uh, His Eminence Kensu Rinpoche Jamba Yeshi, who is the guru of our guru, um, Sam Rinpoche. So His Eminence Kensu Rinpoche Jamba Yeshi actually told our Rinpoche once, you know, that... Um, why are you surprised when things in samsara go badly? You should be surprised when things in samsara go according to plan. Because the nature of samsara is that we suffer. The nature of samsara is that things change. And so it's illogical for us to expect things to go um, well in samsara, right? So if samsara is always going to change, if things are always going to change, then why is it that we blame in order to maintain the status quo when blaming isn't going to change the situation? Right, And also blaming contradicts our existence in samsara, which is based on karma. 
Because if we have the experiences that we have as a result of our karma fruitioning, what is the point of blaming? In fact, knowing that our existence in samsara is based on karma, it should <clears throat> make us reflect, it should make us introspect, um, because that's us taking responsibility for the experiences that we have. If we blame, what we're saying is, I'm not responsible for my karma, which is illogical. Um, we're saying that we're not responsible, I'm not responsible for um, the karma that I've accumulated from all of my countless previous lifetimes. My karma is not my responsibility, it's somebody else's. My experience is not my responsibility, it's somebody else's. And so what Rimchi actually said was, you know, that <clears throat> if you want to blame, if you want to engage in blaming, um, and if you want to blame all your problems and your mistakes and your issues and the challenges you have in life and others, then what you actually need to do is you actually need to give up control of your life. You actually need to accede control of your life and give up any sense of agency um, in your life. Hi, Owen Liu Yen Hong. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I am talking about blaming. So, um, yeah, Ramji said that if you want to blame others for the mistakes, and problems and issues and challenges in your life, then what you need to do is you actually need to give up control for all of the decisions in your life. And you need to give up the agency that you have in your life and give up all the decision-making um, power that you have in your life, right? Why did Rumji say that? Uh, Rumji said that because who is it who makes the decisions in your life? Who chose your partner? It was you. Right, so um, you knew what the, you knew what you were getting into. Who cho who chose to work in the place that you do? You chose to, right? So you knew what kind of environment you were getting into. You knew what kind of boss you were getting into. Who chose the school that you went to? That was you, All right? And who chose to buy all the things in your life that you know um, you are now paying for? That was you as well. So if you have a house with a mortgage, if you have a car with a loan. Oh, if you have phone bills, if you have credit card bills, who chose to make all of those decisions? That was you. Every single thing that you do in your life, the decision-making power rests with you. And whether or not you perceive you have a choice, you always do have a choice. Maybe the option B isn't as easy as option A. Maybe option B isn't as pleasant as option A. But there was, there was always an option B. right? So... If you live at home, as Rumshi said, if you live at home and your parents are um, putting all these rules on you, they're telling you you can't go out after 10 p.m., they're telling you you can't bring a girl or boy home, they're telling you that um, you need to pay rent, they're telling you um, push your chair in when you're at the dinner table, don't put your elbows on the table, and so on. Who chose to continue living at home? That was you. And so as long as you continue to choose living at home, as long as you continue to choose making these choices, what you have to understand is that there are consequences to these choices. And so to blame somebody else for the situation that you're in is illogical because the situation that you are in is the result of all the choices that you have made. And therefore, if you want to blame somebody else, then what you need to do uh, if you want to blame somebody else for the state of your life, for the state that you're in, what you actually need to do is you need to give up all control of your life, give up all of the decision-making power that you have in your life completely to somebody else. And then if they're making all of the decisions, as Rumichi said, if they're making all of the decisions and things go wrong, then it's logical to blame them. Then you can say, oh, my life is like this because you decided this way. My life is like this because you made this choice for me. But if you haven't done that, then it's not logical to blame. If you haven't taken control of your exercise, if you haven't taken control of your nutrition, it's lo illogical to blame somebody else for being out of breath when you walk up the stairs. It's not logical to blame somebody else when you are 40 and you have high blood pressure. You know, it's not logical to blame somebody else when you're the one who made all of the decisions um, for not exercising, for eating whatever you wanted, and for not watching what you want to eat, right? And I'm saying all of this, obviously, as a very, very general situation because I understand that there are many situations in which um, genetics plays a very, very strong part in people's health issues. But as a general um, rule of thumb, if we experience poor health, it's because we didn't make the choice to exercise, we didn't make the choice to 
um, maintain a good diet. And I say this based on my experience as well, all right, um, which I talked about in another video, so I won't get into here. Um, hi, Sukfan. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, okay, so just as I've been talking about um, external factors um, that uh, make that show that it's illogical for us to engage in blame, um, also the state of our practice, right? So how practiced we are, how much progress we've made over the years, or how much progress we haven't made over the years. Um, how many retreats we've done, how many retreats we haven't done, how far along somebody else has moved ahead of us. All of those factors are based on our choices. So how much effort, oops, sorry, how much effort you put into your practice is how much result you're going to get out of it. If we're always making excuses not to do our sadhana, if we're always making excuses not to put Dharma teachings into practice, if we're always making excuses not to um, engage in retreats, the result is in 10, 20 years' time, people who have put in the effort will be way, 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 way ahead of us um, as compared to ourselves because we just haven't put the same amount of effort in. Right? So the same also applies to Dharma work. You know, the... Hi, Andy. Uh, nice to see you here. I do see your question and um, I will actually answer it at the end. All right? So I'll answer your question and Iman's question towards the end. Um, so the... The logic of blaming um, also applies to Dharma work. Um, I have heard many, many, many people say, you know, over the years that um, I will do Dharma work or I'll do more Dharma work I will, or I will volunteer at the temple more um, when I don't have this and this and this commitment, right? Um, but here's the thing. Who made those commitments? Who made the choices to continue the commitments? I'm not saying that you shouldn't abide by your commitments. Don't get me wrong there, right? But I'm saying that um, we have to recognize the role that we play for whether we want to make something possible or not, as opposed to blaming the commitments um, for our ability or inability to engage in more Dharma work or to engage in more Dharma practice. Um, the example that Rameshi always gives is uh, f going to Dharma teachings, right? So as Malaysians, all of us love food. I love food. I, since this movement control order was imposed, I haven't had nasi lemak. And on some days, I will freely admit that I wake up thinking, ah, oh, it would be so nice to have nasi lemak for breakfast this morning. But that's not going to happen for a while yet. But, you know, as Malaysians, all of us love food. And if um, you see my Instagram, you also realise that I really love food. Anyway, so, <clears throat> as Malaysians, what Rumchi said is, we will happily sit in traffic, and we will happily drive for an hour to get food. I know people who will drive to Ipoh from KL on the weekends just to have chicken rice. Okay, that's like, what, a two-hour drive? Just to get chicken rice. They will go there, have chicken rice for lunch, turn around and come back. Okay, that's a two-hour drive to Ipoh to eat chicken rice. At the same time, people will also say, Hiya, KFR is so far, Bandung is so far, it's 45 minutes away, I can't get there, I can't drive at night, it's so far away, I can't go and volunteer because Bandung is so far away. But two hours to Ipoh for chicken rice is not. So <clears throat> that's the example that Rimchi always gave to us, which is um, when we want to, when we want to, we will find a way to make it possible for ourselves to get something. And when we don't want to, we will find excuses. Right? And so, blaming external factors, blaming um, things around us for our perceived inability at the moment, at the moment, um, for our inability to do more volunteering or to do more Dharma work. Blaming is not logical because if we look at other areas and other aspects of our life, when we want to accomplish something, when we want to do something, we go all in to do it. Like, there's no hesitation. Okay, uh, but why is it when it comes to volunteering or why is it when it comes to helping the temple, it's not the same thing. It's not the same level of commitment. If we have volunteered and things have gone wrong, is it fair to blame those situations for um, the experience that we had or is it our responsibility for not having managed things well? So again, blaming also doesn't um, isn't, isn't logical in that kind of circumstance. On a day-to-day -day basis, why is blaming logical? 
in every interaction we find ourselves in, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, um, whether it's in the temple, um, whether it's in any other charity that we might be volunteering in, whether it's with our friends, our friend group, when we're socialising. Um, Bali, I see your question. I'll get, that. I'll get to that at the end. Um, so in, in those types of interactions, blaming is also illogical because we have a choice within those interactions whether we want things to escalate and whether we want things to escalate into conflict. The thing is, just like you, other people don't like to be blamed as well. So that's something that you need to remember, right? If you don't like to be blamed, somebody else doesn't like to be blamed as well. So if you blame somebody else for something having gone wrong, how do you think they're going to feel, right? Um, do you think they're going to be happy with you? Do you think they're going to want to be friends with you um, after, you know, maybe once or twice, if you get blamed for some, if you blame someone else for something, they might let it slide. They'll be like, oh, it's okay. You know, maybe she's having a rough day. Uh, maybe things aren't going so well at work. So um, he's just venting his frustrations. And so that's why he said it's my fault, but it's not, right? But will people want to be friends with you after a while? Will people want to work with you after a while? Um, with children, they're kind of stuck with each other because they are related by blood. But when they get older and a sibling continues to blame, will you continue want to want to be associated with that sibling, right? So it's illogical to blame um, because in every interaction we have with anybody around us, it's always our choice whether we want to escalate things or whether into conflict or whether we want to learn to accept responsibility so that um, things calm down. And I will get into that later when I talk about why um, and what happens when we learn how to stop blaming. All right. So now that I've talked about why blaming is illogical, I also want to talk about why blaming is counterproductive. Number one, blaming is counterproductive because it, it detracts from the actual issue, it detracts from the actual message, it detracts from the actual problem. And instead, it t makes it personal and it leads you to focus on personal relationships, right? So um, let's say you have an issue at work, uh, project hasn't gone so well, instead of blaming the person who um, you perceive to be responsible for that failure, you can actually focus at how to fix the problem. So instantly, in that kind of situation, instantly when you blame, what's going to happen? The other person is going to feel very put on, put upon, right? They're going to be like, well, why are you putting all the responsibility on me? This is a project. This is a team project. Um, let's say you were the project manager. This is your fault because you were the project manager. Instantly in that kind of environment, in that kind of situation, it immediately focuses into a personal thing. It becomes a personal thing as opposed to fixing the problem ahead of you. So blaming is counterproductive because it f causes or it forces the people in that interaction to stop focusing on the issue and to fo stop focusing on the problem that needs to be solved and instead it makes you um, turn that entire environment and event into something that's personal. Blaming is also counterproductive because it reinforces this kind of defeatist attitude in us, it makes us doubt our, ourselves, it makes us doubt our capabilities. Um, <clears throat> basically, when you blame, what you are saying is, I can't handle change. I'm not able to handle change. And I can't handle it when things go wrong. So in a work environment, for example, I say this because I think it's mostly adults watching this and fewer kids. Um, but in a work environment, what happens when a boss sees you blaming over and over and over again. The subtle, unconscious, subliminal message that you're sending to your boss is, I can't handle it when things go wrong. I can't fix it when things go wrong. What I will do is I will always hold somebody else responsible. Is that the kind of message that you want to send to your boss? All right. And why is it that you want to say something like that about yourself, even on an ordinary basis? You see, what we don't realize is that when we blame somebody else, we're chipping away at our own self-esteem. We're chipping away at our own sense of self-worth. We're chipping away at how much we value ourselves. We are saying that we don't have any control and we don't have any agency over our own lives. And... Um, that all of this control, as a grown adult, all of this control still rests in somebody else. So in blaming somebody else, we 
reinforce this defeatist attitude that we have, um, that we are not in full control of ourselves and of our choices in life. When we blame, it's counterproductive because we stay stagnant, uh, we stay stuck. I don't know if you guys can hear that, that's a gecko. Um, it's very nice working in KFR because all you hear all day long are birds, um, nature basically, birds, wind in the trees, geckos, dogs, and so on. Uh, anyway, so what happens is when we blame, we become stagnant. Um, we stay in our comfort zones because we're saying that if things progress, if things get a little bit more difficult, I'm not going to be able to handle it. And um, if all things go wrong, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to blame somebody else because I can't handle that little bit of difference, that little bit of additional difficulty. And then what happens is in many, many years' time, when we look back, people will have progressed far ahead of us. Um, it's not somebody else's fault, you know, that uh, they got promoted. It's not somebody else's fault that they picked up new skills and we didn't. It's not somebody else's fault that they learned to do new things and we didn't. They chose to learn to do new things. They chose to develop. They chose to improve. We didn't. And so when we blame and we get into this habit of blaming, what happens is that our attitude and our approach to life is that when things get difficult, when I'm challenged, I'm not going to be able to handle it. And so I'm going to find and I'm going to need to find somebody else to blame. As a result of that, what happens is when we blame, we increase our anger. Um, we increase our way of looking at things very negatively. When she said that we increase our anger, we increase our way of looking at things negatively, and we increase our habituation of putting responsibility onto other people. And what happens as a result of all of that? Let's not talk about karma and merit and um, future lives and all of that, because I know that many people like Buddhist teachings, but they don't necessarily prescribe to the more esoteric aspects of it. Um, they like it more as a self-development, self-help approach, right? So what happens when you engage in blaming? Let's not talk about karma. What happens is it leads to loneliness. Because as I mentioned earlier, who likes to be blamed? If you don't like to be blamed, do you think somebody else likes to be blamed? And if somebody else doesn't like to be blamed and you keep blaming everybody else, what is going to happen eventually is that people aren't going to want to be around you um, because people aren't going to want to be around somebody else who's always blaming them. Um, a husband who always blames the wife, eventually the wife, unless she is, she's a saint. Uh, oh, Tashi Dele Rumbushi, it's nice to see you here. Thank you for joining. And hi, Hannah. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, so, yeah. What happens is when we blame, it increases our loneliness because people don't want to be around someone else who's always blaming them. Um, a husband who's always blaming his wife, a wife who's always blaming the husband. Unless they're extremely understanding um, in special circumstances, most people don't want to be around someone like that. You know, wives don't like to be blamed, wives don't like to be complained about, kids don't like to be blamed. Um, it creates a sense of ill feeling, it creates disharmony, um, not just at home, but in the workplace as well. Um, it creates conflict, excuse me, it creates conflict and um, it eventually creates a lack of respect in us, uh, for us. If you think about it, blaming is instinctual, almost instinctual, right? Because we are trained to blame when from, from when we were very young. We're trained to always put the fault in somebody else. But the ironic thing is that in every single arena, in every single aspect of our lives, nobody respects someone who blames. Nobody respects someone who engages in blaming. And people don't like somebody who blames. All right? So the irony is that while our environment trains us to blame, at the same time, everybody doesn't like to be blamed and everybody doesn't like people who blame. And so then, if you're thinking about this, if blaming leads to anger, if blaming leads to loneliness, if blaming leads to um, anxiety, if blaming leads to habituating ourselves into perceiving everything negatively, then you might be thinking, okay, since, so since blaming you know, leads me to being lonely and, and so on, like, how am I going to stop blaming? All right, so um, the first thing that Rumushi advised was we need to introspect. Um, we need to introspect about how I've changed, how we've changed, and um, introspect about our 
involvement in that situation that led to us led, led to things going wrong, uh, led to relationships breaking down, uh, our responsibility and our involvement in that kind of situation. So there is a difference between examining and introspecting and doing a post-mortem and uh, blaming someone. When you do a post-mortem or when you, do, uh, when you gauge introspection, what you're doing is you're thinking, what could I have done differently for a different outcome? Uh, what, and what can I do differently next time? What can I do to change things? When you blame, what you're saying is, whose fault is this? Right? Whose fault is it that things went wrong? Whose fault is it that things went badly? Whose fault is it that the relationship broke down? That's blaming. On the other side of the coin, you have um, post-mortem, you have introspection, you have debriefing, whatever you want to call it. And that is, what can I do differently? Where did things go wrong and what can I do differently um, so that I get a different outcome next time? And what was my level of involvement in this? And how can I personally change things next time? So also important in how we want to stop blaming is we need to change our language, right? Because <clears throat> we don't think about it, but a change in language has a very, very powerful impact on our change in attitude and our change in mindset, body, speech, and mind. So our mouth is saying one thing, but if we change what our mind is thinking, then our mouth will utter different words. Our mind will also have a different attitude. Our mind will also have a different um, way of <clears throat> observing, perceiving the world around us. Hi, Yinping, and uh, hi, Pastor Honey. Thank you for joining. So um, if you guys are... Uh, yeah, uh, I'm talking about blaming, and uh, we're about halfway through. All right, so I have some questions which I will answer and which I will get to at the end. But um, yeah, so as I was just saying... Excuse me, sorry. Morning coffee. So as I was just saying, um, a change in language is very important because when we have a change in language, it also changes our attitude and it also changes our mindset and our approach to things. Um, and it will help us to reduce our blaming approach to things. If we're habituated into saying, well, what can I do differently next time? And we keep habituating, habituating ourselves into thinking that eventually what's going to happen is the words that come out of our mouth won't be, whose fault is this? Is it your fault? Is it your fault? Is it your fault? You know, that kind of speech will change. What will come out is, well, guys, things went wrong. So let's see how we can do things differently next, next time. Let's see how we can change things. And let's see what we, each of us can contribute towards making things a success. Right? So... Changing our language will also change our mindset and change our speech. The other thing is, you know, realizing that we can't control other people, but we can control ourselves. So the Buddhist parable to that is, um, which one's easier? Covering the, if, if the world is completely covered with shards of glass, um, which one's easier? Covering the entire world with leather or covering the soles of our feet? Right? So you can't control the world with leather and you can't cover the world with leather. It's not possible, but you can cover your soles of your feet with leather. That's the Buddhist parable. The parable that my mother gave me is, I don't trust, I trust you as a driver, but I don't trust other drivers. Right? So you can control your own driving ability, but you can't control the driving ability of other people. You can't control other people's attention span. You can't control other people's sleepiness and so on. So Buddhist Secular example, in both cases, you know, it's logical to conclude that you can control yourself, but you can't control other people. And so when you realize that, when you understand that, then it will also help to reduce instances and uh, habituation and tendency to blame in our lives. Also useful in uh, how to stop blaming is realizing that blaming can't change the outcome. So that proverb, verse... Um, whatever it is that you want to call it, um, no use crying over spilled milk. Um, that is very, very true. There's no use crying over spilled milk because blaming somebody else, blaming yourself, blaming people around you, it's not going to change the outcome, right? Um, if 
your group project at school has already imploded and you've gotten an F for it, blaming somebody else in the group isn't going to change the F. Maybe talking to the professor, asking if you can do extra work for extra credits, that will change the situation. But blaming your group members isn't going to change the situation. It's only going to increase animosity. It's only going to increase disharmony. It's only going to increase people looking at you and thinking, hey, the next time I'm in a group project with that person and if things go wrong, I'm going to be stuck with the blame. Right? So realizing that blaming isn't going to change the outcome, whether it's blaming yourself or whether it's blaming somebody else, realizing that blaming isn't going to change the outcome will also help to reduce our habituation to blame. And then from a more esoteric, if you will, point of view, more esoteric approach, pujas and sadhanas and prayers are very, very, very useful in helping to stop blame. Now, why is that? So I'm not saying go to the Buddha and pray, please, please, Doji Shukden, please, Lord Buddha, please bless me with the ability to stop blaming. I'm not saying that. Right? You can do that if you want, but I'm not saying that that's the approach. Um, what I am saying is that when you do regular prayers and when you do regular pujas, how is it logical for you to pray to absorb the suffering of all sentient beings when at the same time you're blaming all sentient beings for the source of your suffering? Right? So, at the beginning of our pujas, at the be beginning of our sadhanas, when we um, recite the four immeasurables, Semchin Tapji, Dewadang, Dewi Gyulan, Dewi when we recite those, and we're saying, um, may everyone have happiness and its causes, may everyone be free of suffering and its causes, how is it logical to pray for that when you're saying, no, but actually, you are the source of all my sufferings, you are the source of all of my problems, and you are the source of all the difficulties that I have in my life. It doesn't make sense to pray to absorb the suffering of all sentient beings when we're simultaneously blaming them for the source of our problems and for the source of our sufferings. How can we generate bodhicitta when we are doing our prayers and our pujas and our sadhanas? How can we generate bodhicitta whilst simultaneously blaming other people? It doesn't make sense to do that. And so when you engage in pujas and when you engage in sadhanas regularly and you engage in the generation of bodhicitta, regularly. What you're doing is every single day, you're taking out a portion of your time to rehabituate yourself into not blaming somebody else. You're actually rehabituating yourself within those hours to take responsibility for the difficulties in your life and the difficulties in somebody else's life. Right? So at this juncture, <laughs> hey Sharon, thank you for joining. Um, at this juncture, I think it might be actually um, Appropriate to answer Bradley's question, would it be good to focus on the eight verses of thought transformation to counter blaming? Yes. Yes, it would be. Um, and that was one of our Guru, His Eminence, Kyabji Sam Tuku Rinpoche's favourite prayers, the eight verses of thought transformation. It's something that Rinpoche advised all of us to recite every single day. I actually have it there on my cabinet. Um, that yellow poster over there on my cabinet um, pinned up is actually the eight verses of thought transformation. And yes, it would be very, very good to... Um, recite and uh, to do the eight verses of thought transformation every single day to counter blaming because one of the verses is um, offering the victory to others right that is a direct antidote to blaming because what you're saying is even when I'm wrong and even when things have gone badly I'm still going to let somebody else win even if I have won I'm also still going to let somebody else win I'm always going to let somebody else win blaming is the total opposite of that blaming is saying Nobody else wins ever, and it's only me, myself, and I, right? So when you do your prayers and when you do your pujas and sadhanas every single day, um, what you're doing is within those hours, you're setting aside time to rehabituate yourself and to plant the seeds and to create the causes for yourself to stop blaming other people because you are actually taking responsibility for your suffering, for other people's suffering, for your happiness, and for other people's happiness, right? So that's why... Um, if you want to say, that's one of the other reasons why, excuse me, why doing puja, doing asadhanas every single day is very, very, very important. All right. So what happens when you stop blaming? All right. So what happens when you stop blaming is, okay, first of all, what you need to realize is you will never see somebody successful blaming somebody else. You don't see Jack Ma 
blaming other people for his misfortunes. You don't see uh, Nelson Mandela blaming other people for his misfortunes. You didn't see Gandhi blaming other people for his misfortunes. He, these people held other people responsible and they held other people accountable for their actions, but they didn't blame them. There is a very big difference. Blaming someone else is saying, this is your fault, right? But holding somebody else accountable and recognizing who's responsible is very, very different. Holding somebody else response, uh, accountable is saying, you were involved in this, Let's see how we can make this situation change. Let's see how we can make the situation different. You don't see Bill Gates blaming other people. What you do see is Bill Gates setting up foundations to find a to warn people about things, to find a cure for things, to work on vaccines. But you don't see Bill Gates blaming other people. You, what you do see is you see successful people observing a situation, analyzing a situation, and thinking, okay, it's already happened. How can I take responsibility for this? And how can I find a way to make things different, right? How can I find a way to make things different, not just for myself, but for other people as well? So you don't see successful people blaming. You see unsuccessful people blaming. What you see is unsuccessful people saying, it's that person's fault that my business idea didn't take off the ground. It's that person's fault that my invention didn't work. It's that person's fault that my group project didn't get an A. And as I'm saying this, what you realize, or what I am realizing is, just as uh, Kok Lian said, you know, the tone of our speech is changing. The tone of our speech is a very good first step, because just as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, how many times have I heard? How many times in my life have I heard people saying that? And every single time I, I hear it, it's just like, ugh, it really rankles and it's really unpleasant and it creates a very negative atmosphere. I don't even recounting these examples. It doesn't feel nice. You know, so. Imagine what it's like for a person on the receiving end of it. So what happens when we stop blaming is we become successful because you never see somebody else who is successful engaging in blaming. We retrain as a result of, of stopping blame. We retrain our mind to become problem solving because we retrain our mind to look at tackling the problem ahead of us as opposed to ascribing blame to somebody else. So as we do that more and more and more, what happens is we find that we become very, very good at problem solving. Aren't there people in your life that you can go to that when things go wrong, they always seem to have a solution for something? Okay, for most of us, obviously, um, that person was our guru, Sam Rinpoche, uh, who was the ultimate problem solver, right? But the thing is, we can also become a very close approximation of that we can get closer to that kind of state, which is that each time we stop blaming, each time we do our sadhanas, we retrain our minds to become problem solving. And then you do that for one day, then you do that for two days and three days and so on. And then sooner or later, before you know it, 10 years time, you've learned to stop blaming and you've retrained your mind to become good at problem solving. And so when you stop blaming and you become very good at problem solving, what happens also is that you regain control and you regain agency over your life. Um, you regain responsibility and you learn to focus. When you learn to focus on how you can make things different and how you can make things successful, you will regain control in your practice you will regain control in your professional life, you will regain control in your personal life, and you also regain control in your health. Because when you stop blaming other people for how unhealthy you are, and you start taking responsibility for your own state of health, of course you're going to regain control over your state of health. Because if I'm the one who's responsible for it, of course I'm going to do something for it. As what Rumji said, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. All right? So if you're always blaming somebody else for your lack of attainments or your lack of practice, of course you are not going to get very much out of it because you're not putting effort into your own practice. You're actually putting effort into putting somebody else responsible for your lack of practice or for your lack of attainments. On top of, you know, um, what else? On top of retraining yourself to be problem solving, on top of, you know, gaining success, um, on top of not being lonely, um, you also regain control over your emotions. The interesting thing about blaming is that we think that we're putting responsibility or we think we're putting um, 
holding somebody else responsible for the way we feel, for the way we think and so on. But in actuality, in blaming, we are also giving up control of how happy and how unhappy we are. All right, so um, when things go wrong, when things don't go according to plan and you say, oh, it's somebody else's fault, you're allowing somebody else's decisions, you're allowing somebody else's actions to control how angry, how unhappy, how happy, how sad and how successful and how unsuccessful you feel. When you're saying that, no, I'm responsible for myself and I'm responsible for my own actions and for my own decisions and I will bear the consequences of these, you're saying that I'm responsible for my own level of happiness. I'm responsible for how successful and how unsuccessful I am. I'm responsible for how I view myself. I'm responsible for how much self-worth I have for, uh, or how much belief I have in myself. And as I mentioned, you know, much earlier, um, people don't like to be blamed, right? So obviously the logical conclusion is that when you stop blaming other people, what happens is people will like you. Um, because people like people who don't complain about them. Um, blaming at the root of it is essentially complaining. It's essentially saying this person did this to me, that person did that to me, that person is responsible for this and so on. And when that happens, over time, people will avoid people who blame or who complain about them. So the logical um, other, other side of the coin to that is that when we stop blaming, people will like us. People will admire us and people will respect us. Now, if you guys look at the current situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, which is, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, who is it that we admire? Who is it that we respect? Do we admire and do we respect the people who blame other people for lack of PPE or for the curve not flattening? Do we admire people for... Do we admire the people who um, don't implement enough tests and so on? We don't admire those people. We don't admire people who ascribe blame, even in this situation. The people we do admire, even in this COVID-19 pandemic, are the people who see a shortage in PPEs and then resolve it. People who see a shortage in testing and then resolve it. We admire the people who see um, there, there is a need for a vaccine and then they work towards it or they create the conditions for um, vaccine testing to be done or vaccine, what do you want to call it, um, discoveries to be made. We admire those people. We admire people who take charge of the situation and who are not afraid to bear responsibility for it. We don't admire the people who blame. Who are the people in your office that you respect? Do you respect the managers who blame you to the boss when things go wrong? Do you respect the supervisor who blames you when things go wrong? Or who hold you responsible or who say that it's your fault? No. You don't respect those people. You don't respect the people in your um, who you're working with. You don't respect the colleagues who tattletale on you, the boss, and say that it's your fault that things went wrong. You don't respect those people. What The people you do respect are the ones who take the heat for you, right? So if you're all working on something and your superior or your supervisor, um, things go wrong and your supervisor takes the heat for the entire team in front of the boss, what happens over time when that happens again and again? People gain respect for that supervisor. People gain respect for the project manager. So when we engage in blaming, or when we stop blaming rather, when we stop blaming, what happens is people start to respect us. People start to admire us. In war, who do, who do soldiers respect? Do soldiers respect generals who blame? Or do soldiers respect generals who take charge and generals who take responsibility? So generals who, you know, um, will be demoted to protect their soldiers. As I listened during our One World War II documentary, but generals who will take the blame and take the heat and even be demoted um, in order to protect their soldiers, those are the generals that people respect, not the ones who blame their troops. Even as kids, right? When we are doing physical education, when we're doing PE, um, who's the person? that no one ever wants on their team. Barring lack of athletic ability, who is the person that nobody wants on their team? The person that nobody wants on their team is the one who's always blaming other team members. The one who's always running up and down the field saying, oh, um, we didn't score the goal because you didn't pass to me. Oh, we didn't manage to um, shoot that basket because you didn't want to pass to me, you're a ball hog. Okay, okay, you can blame the ball hog, obviously, but you know, in general, people 
who are in sports teams don't want to blame other people, um, who don't want to include in the team other people who blame. When you look at after match interviews, um, after game interviews, what happens is the players that you respect is are the players who say, well, um, I could have trained a little harder, I could have trained a little better, I could have watched my nutrition a little more, I could have worked a little more closely and listened to what my coaches said, um, and then I would have been better. The players who say, oh, it's my coach's fault, um, it's my nutritionist's fault, and so on, those are the players who never really make it to the top of their game. It's the players who take responsibility for themselves who will actually um, rise to the top of their field. All right, so um, today I covered why we blame. I covered I'm sorry, if you can hear my stomach rumbling, it's because I haven't had breakfast. Um, so today I covered why we blame. I covered why it's illogical to blame. Um, I covered um, how to stop blaming. And I also covered what happens when we stop blaming. Now, there were a couple of questions here. Um, Bradley, I've answered yours. So yes, I would say that it's very good to focus on the eight verses of thought transformation to counter blaming. Um, let's see, okay, Iman's question. Pastor Jinai, how can we handle better on self-blaming or something that is re irreversible, which paralyzes us whenever we think about it. Okay, so it's not something that's going to change overnight. Let me read that question a little more slowly because I realized I just sped through it and maybe not all of you caught it. Uh, Pastor Jinai, how can we handle better on self-blaming or something that is irreversible, which paralyzes us whenever we think about it? Thanks. Okay, so like I said, it's not going to happen overnight because um, we're not talking about just these 10, 20, 30 years of our life so far that um, we have habituated ourselves into blaming. We're talking about countering countless lifetimes of blaming because if you realise we weren't human in just this lifetime alone, right? We were humans also in many, many previous lifetimes. So we have millennia, centuries or whatever of years of blaming, of being habituated to blaming. So first thing is realizing that stopping, reducing the habituation to blame isn't going to happen overnight. Um, it's a, it really is a step-by-step -step process with every single interaction um, that you have, even interactions with yourself. Second, second thing is realizing that self-blaming um, is unproductive because self-blaming doesn't actually change the situation. You actually already gave the answer to yourself in your question, which is that the situation is irreversible. Now, focusing on the fact that the situation is irreversible, focusing on the fact that you can't change an outcome that has already happened, um, meditating on that, the outcome, hasn't, uh, the outcome can't be changed because the outcome has already happened. Meditating on that is actually going to help us to stop blaming ourselves why? Because what is blaming yourself going to do? How is blaming yourself going to change a situation that is already going to happen? You can't move backwards. You can only move forwards. It's like what Rumi said about the mind being a river or time being like a river. It's always going in one direction. You can't reverse. You can't reverse something that's already happened. Meditating on the fact that a situation um, or an outcome that has already happened and is irreversible um, is helpful because eventually you do realize that no matter what it is that you do, no matter what it is that you um, change now um, or do differently now, will not change the situation that's already happened. The only thing that you can do is focus on time that is already coming, right? If the next time that it happens, what can I do differently about um, that situation? So that's why I mentioned um, the importance um, of understanding the, the difference between post-mortem and blaming. Because blaming is saying, whose fault is it? And in this case, we're saying that it's my fault. If you do a post-mortem, what you're saying is, how can I do things differently next time? How can I change and make things different for myself and for other people next time? Um, Yeah, I, I think that it's important for us to, in, especially in that situation, it's very important for us to retrain ourselves to um, retrain ourselves to retrain our speech, to retrain our language 
um, because it will retrain our attitude and it will retrain our mindset um, and our approach to things. Approaching things as a post-mortem, as opposed to approaching things as um, an exercise in self-blame, will be very, very helpful in reducing our, um, or actually in improving our ability to better handle um, situations in which we engage in self-blaming because engaging in a post-mortem will retrain our minds into focusing on the situation as opposed to focusing on ourselves. Engaging in a post-mortem would retrain our minds into thinking or into viewing situations as a case of how can I do things differently next time. All right. If I didn't answer that question clearly enough, please let me know. I will get to it um, after this feed has ended. All right, Iman. Um, Andy said, how about things beyond our control? For example, you knew that particular decision made by your boss is wrong, hence you have advice and told the effect, but yet your boss still proceed. So, um, for that, what I would say is, you did your best. Um, you did what you could, right? I'm assuming that you would have done what you could. You would have warned uh, people uh, appropriately. I'm sure all of us can think of a very, very recent situation in which people were warned about um, the pandemic and our bosses chose to proceed against advice, right? So it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Despite people's best efforts, they will warn their supervisors, they'll warn their bosses, they'll warn their project managers, and the boss still chooses to act against advice. It's your boss's prerogative. It's your boss's choice. It's not your, it's not your choice. It's not your decision. As you mentioned, it's actually out of your control. So being that it's out of your control, um, how do you propose you wish to control it? Now, I can talk about other things, for example, um, I, can, I mean, what I can say is I can say other things like maybe there's an, a different way. Maybe there's a different way of approaching your boss. Maybe there's a different way of creating an environment or a situation in which your boss will be encouraged to move or to decide in a particular way and so on. But I'm assuming based on what you asked that you did your best to advise your boss um, towards a particular decision and your boss still chose to do it otherwise. Um, and if that's the case and if you already tried your best, I don't think that there's anything that you can do um, to change the situation. Yeah, so what Sharon said is instead of blaming, fixing the issue or solution is better. It turns a negative situation into a more positive one. Right, so um, yeah, that, that's exa exactly it. It's, blaming doesn't actually change an outcome. Blaming doesn't actually change a result. Blaming ourselves and blaming other people doesn't actually change an outcome in, or a result. But fixing the situation or fixing the issue of finding a solution to the issue is better. When we find a solution or um, fix the issue, we invariably end up feeling better about ourselves. Why? Because that's one success that we can chalk up on our scoreboard. And when we do that over and over again, over time, what happens is we, um, when we feel better about ourselves, um, we feel more in control about ourselves. And so over time, we actually um, habituate ourselves um, into not self-blaming and into not blaming other people. Um, okay, let's see. All right. Um, before I end for today, yes, almost on time. Sorry, I have a tendency to like run over, as you guys know from the Wizard Day sharing. I have a tendency to run over, but today I'm on time. So um, before I end, <clears throat> what I want to say is, um, what I want to encourage everyone is to set a good intention for the new week, being that today is Sunday and we are moving into Monday tomorrow. Um, set a good intention for the week ahead. Um, be, put your meditation skills with JP into use and be, practice awareness. Um, practice awareness for the interactions around you. Each time you feel yourself falling into the tendency to blame, catch yourself, right? As um, Bradley suggested earlier um, about the A versus a thought transformation, whenever I feel a fictive emotion arise, I'll firmly confront and avert it. So 
uh, when you find yourself in a situation where you feel yourself falling into the tendency to blame, catch yourself and think, no, today I'm not going to blame. How am I going to approach this interaction differently? How am I going to help and make this situation or find a solution for the issue that's in front of me? I'm not going to blame somebody else. I'm not going to blame myself. I'm going to focus on the issue, issue or the situation at hand. And set the intention for yourself for this week. How am I going to reduce blaming for myself this week? And how am I going to uh, reduce blaming not just for myself or uh, reduce you know, self-blame as well? And also set the intention, who am I going to benefit this week? Who am I going to make a difference for this week? When we first um, became pastors, before we became pastors, before our ordination, our head pastor, Pastor Ye'i, actually um, gave us a little TED talk, uh, if you will. And she told all of us that whenever she wakes up every single morning, the first thing that she does is she will think, she has trained herself to think, who am I going to help today? Every single morning when she wakes up, she thinks, who am I going to help today? And that's why you see Pasi Ye'i constantly helping other people. Pasi Ye'i constantly arranging outcall pujas when it wasn't the movement control order. Um, you see Pasi Ye'i constantly organizing pujas, um, helping people with cremations, doing last rites, counseling people. You see Pasi Ye'i constantly helping people because every single morning she has trained herself to think when she wakes up, the first thing she thinks is, who am I going to benefit today? All right, so I'm going to set the challenge for you guys this week, which is um, set an intention for yourself. Who, how am I going to stop blaming for this week? How am I going to reduce my blaming for this week? Okay, so let's not say stop, let's say reduce. How am I going to reduce my tendency to blame this week? And who am I going to benefit this week? And how am I going to make a difference for somebody else this week? And also take some time to reflect on the past week. Who did I hurt? And that who can be somebody else, it can also be yourself. Because self-blaming is actually counterproductive. Um, as you mentioned, Iman, self-blaming is paralyzing. And self-blaming doesn't move us forwards. It doesn't help to move us forwards. It doesn't help to move us beyond um, an outcome that can't be changed, an outcome that has already been fixed. So reflect on the past week. Um, who, who did I hurt? Um, and that who includes myself, that who includes other people, and also how can I do things differently this week so that I don't hurt myself and I don't hurt other people anymore, all right? Um, I'm going to end it here for this week before I continue because I can babble on and on and on and on um, for another hour or so. So I'm going to end for this week, but I, would just, I do want to tell you guys um, that if you do have any requests, if you do have any uh, requests for prayers or for offerings to be made, um, please leave me a comment in the, um, yeah, please leave me a message in the comment of this live video feed. Um, and also, hi, Glian, thank you for joining us. Um, Rasananda Das, I do see your question. I'm so sorry we're out of time, but I will answer your question once this feed is over, all right? Um, please forgive me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do want to tell you guys about some upcoming programs that we have for today. Um, on Tuesday at 8 p.m., we have Ramachi's Swift Return Puja that's being streamed live on the Kachara Retreat, uh, Kachara Facebook fan page. I'm so used to staying Kachara Forest Retreat Facebook fan page. But yes, Tuesday 8 p.m., Sam Ramachi's Swift Return Puja on the Kachara fan page. Um, th Tuesday 9.30 p.m., the Easy Dharma for the New Normal, um, which is being shared, I believe, by Pastor David and Pastor Nero. Um, so that's on Tuesdays. And then today, if you are Chinese speaking, um, at 2 p.m., there is the Doji Shukden Sadhana um, that's been live streamed and as well as the live chat with Pastor Albert at 3 p.m. That's happening in Chinese language on the Kachara Chinese Facebook page. All right, so um, if you guys have any requests for prayers and offerings, do leave me a message in the comment section below this video and I will get to that for you this afternoon. I'll take pictures and post it up on the comment section so that you guys can see that the prayers have actually been done. All right. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so sorry that it was a bit rambly and a bit disjointed. And um, But my first video live stream, I will be back next week, same time, same place, uh, Sunday at 10 p.m. on the Kachara Facebook fan page. Um, if, you guys, if you guys have any questions, um, like I said, 
leave it in the comment section below. I'll either respond to it immediately after this live stream or I will address it um, at the beginning of next week's live streaming session. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining. And um, again, as I've mentioned so many previous times in many previous videos, thank you so much for all of your support and for watching all of the videos that have been put out um, over this last however many weeks. All right. Um, it's been an interesting change for us putting things online this often. Um, but thank you guys so much. Don't forget to do your dedication prayers wherever you are. Um, when I end this feed, do your dedication prayers and um, dedicate the merits that were generated as a result of this Dharma sharing. Not just from the sharing, but from you guys also listening to, um, taking the time out on your Sunday to listen to my babbling ramblings. All right? So thank you guys so much and I will see you next week, Sunday, 10am Malaysian time, same time, same place. Thank you guys. Thank you.